All right, time to get back to proving Masayuki's alibi. Let's go. With Yuki Ona transformed to be a tiny bunny seated on his lap, Masayuki tells the police of how his ex-wife had plotted to kill him by poisoning his energy drink when they were married. Apparently, she was cheating on Masayuki and intended to take over his wealth. Since things did not go exactly as she had planned, Masayuki was saved. While she admitted her crime to Masayuki, he did not report her to the police, as he had learned his lesson with his previous betrayal by Hayato. The police agree to his kind nature, because despite having irrefutable proof of attempted murder, Masayuki still chose to divorce his wife with a false reason to save her reputation, and also split half of his wealth in her favor. Nonetheless, the police inform him about a hidden letter they had found in her apartment that blamed Masayuki in the event of her strange death. The letter said that Miharu truly believed that Masayuki would come looking for her to exact revenge because she thought he would resent her and even found his behavior creepy. She had the opinion that Masayuki pretended to be kind and generous through the divorce proceedings only to retaliate later and expressly mention the same in her letter that Masayuki parted with her on good terms solely because he wouldn't be suspected of killing her. Miharu even knew that Hayoto had died three years after his betrayal incident. Despite him dying in a car accident, Miharu believed Masayuki had a hand in Hayato's death and hence was scared for herself too. Further, the police show him a shot from the security camera of a mall a week before Miharu's death. They imply that he may have lied about not having met Miharu since their divorce, as the picture shows Masayuki with a female that looks like Miharu. Masayuki tells them that she might look like her, but it isn't actually Miharu. When he is unable to give them any clarification on the identity of this woman, they take him away to the police station for further questioning. When he returns home, Yuki Ona scolds him for being such a loner, since if he just as much as talked to his neighbors, he might might have had an alibi to prove him innocent. He reminds her that he did indeed have an alibi, as the day of the incident was when the two of them had enjoyed tempura at home and had spent the night drinking. This relieves Yugi Ona, but Masayuki brings to her notice that he cannot really mention her as his alibi. Additionally, because she looks similar to Miharu, the police already suspect him anyway. This prompts Yugi Ona to ask Masayuki why he would marry a female that looked like her. Helplessly, he replies that the white illusion he witnessed in the snow that day, on the brink of his death all those years ago, was the only thing that had not betrayed him. Because of that trust, he married someone who looked familiar. He admits that he felt bad about comparing Miharu to Yuki Ona even during their marriage and hence couldn't fault her for cheating on him and even went easy on her through the divorce. While he does feel like he is trapped because he cannot reveal his true alibi to the police, which is making him a suspect, he pulls himself together and decides to find the killer to prove his own innocence before matters get even more out of hand. Yuki Ona manages to stop him from heading out of the house without a plan or any leads to find the culprit. While putting him to bed, she thinks of asking her lady for help. Finally! Nine days later, Yuki Ona flies Masayuki into the mountains to meet Kotoko. Yuki Ona greets the goddess of wisdom by bowing to her and thanking her for accepting her request to help. Masayuki also thanks Kotoko after she introduces herself to him. When Yuki Ona inquires about Kotoko's boyfriend not having accompanied her on her journey, Kotoko sulks and replies that she had invited him, but he chose his work instead because he needs money. And she keeps up her venting session for so long that the monsters that escorted Kotoko up the mountains urged Yukiona and Masayuki to have a seat. We get you, Kotoko. You're cute. Really, who wouldn't want to spend time with you? But uh, money always wins, honey. Dragging herself back to the matter at hand, Kotoko explains that she has looked into things briefly. Wanting to ensure that Yukiono isn't being taken advantage of, Kotoko launches into a monologue trying to convince Masayuki that it is possible that he actually killed his ex-wife and that his alibi is fake. She goes on to say that Yukiona doesn't keep time like humans do and hence 
she wouldn't really know one day from another. When Masayuki asks her what he would have gained by murdering his ex-wife and lying about it to Yukiona, Kotoko replies that this would result in Masayuki gaining Yukiona's full trust. This trust would then mean that Yukiono would willingly do whatever Masayuki demanded from her in the future, including maybe even killing the colleagues that betrayed Masayuki and kicked him out of his own company. Kotoko says all this so convincingly that Yukiono gets on her knees to plead and defend Masayuki, agreeing that while she does believe in him and that she might really even be willing to kill for him, she also knows that he hasn't killed anybody, nor does he have any intention of doing so. Hearing Yukiono's heartfelt plea on his behalf, Masayuki is moved. Kotoko reveals that she knows he couldn't have killed his ex-wife and that she fabricated a web of lies just so Masayuki realizes that Yukiono trusts him so much that she found the courage to defy her goddess and speak on his behalf. She urges him to start life afresh and stop distrusting people and running away from situations. He promises to do just that, but asks what can be done about this case before he can begin to live again. Katoko replies that she already knows who the culprit is. We get to know who Maharu's killer is the next time. Do I have to remind you of that tiny bell icon? Stick around, folks.